Uh, hello and welcome to this workshop. Thank you all for attending. Uh, this is a, a multidisciplinary and interdepartmental workshop focusing on the quantitative and qualitative research in health science. My name is Cotton Coslett. I am the online learning librarian and I am the subject liaison to the nursing and public health departments. And I'll allow my colleague to introduce himself. Okay, uh, thank you, Cotton. Okay, uh, my name is Luhua Mahmoudou and I'm assistant professor in the Department of Public Health. We welcome you to this workshop. Thank you very much. All right, so I want to just briefly review what we'll be discussing in this workshop and sort of the order and format we'll be doing that. We'll be beginning with a focus on quantitative research, discussing what it is, how it can be used, and how it can be located using electronic databases. Then we will turn to qualitative research and uh, roughly follow that same pattern. What is it, how it can be used, and how it can be located using electronic databases. So let's jump right in and we can start by discussing quantitative research. Uh, quanti quantitative research methods emphasize objective measurements in the statistical, mathematical, or numerical analysis of data. It focuses on gathering numerical data and generalizing it across groups of people or to explain a particular phenomenon. Uh, I, for me, at least, uh, the most important phrase there is numerical data is sort of how I generally think of quantitative research in a broad picture. A good example of this might be something like, what is the relationship between chronic illness and cr clinical depression? But we also like to think about how quantitative research is gathered. Uh, that can be a helpful way of sort of picturing how the, the methods uh, are used and how this information is gathered. Quantitative research is often gathered using polls, questionnaires, uh, surveys, and it's important to point out that in this case, by surveys, we're referring to uh, uh, controlled choice surveys, such as a- Good morning, thank you for calling Will Be Held. Or a Likert scale uh, as well. And oftentimes, uh, quantitative research is based on pre-existing data sets, and those are subjected to statistical analysis. There are some characteristics uh, of quantitative research. Uh, one is that, as I mentioned here, data is in the form of numbers and statistics, often arranged in tables. Uh, that does not mean to say that any article with tables or charts is quantitative. However, quantitative data is usually expressed best using tables and charts and non-textual forms. I will pass over to my colleague. Okay, so I take over from uh, Cotton. So now we are going to look at uh, the types of quantitative research. You know, uh, he have already introduced you to what a uh, quantitative research is. So what are some of the types of quanti uh, quantitative research we might be looking at? So first of all, uh, you might all know about descriptive. Now, when we look at a descriptive quantitative research, we are looking at a, a description of uh, attribute within a population. Yeah, so for any given health data, you might want to uh, look at what are the descriptive of attribute or characteristics within the data. And there's quite often something which have been used when it comes to collecting uh, quantitative uh, research. So another type of quantitative research is the uh, causal comparison. So this type of research is actually looking at comparing variables, uh, given to uh, given variables of a quantitative data. So uh, when it comes to this cause uh, comparison, you might want to know the cause and effect of these variables. And this cause uh, comparison specifically have one variable, which is the dependent variable, which is sometimes also called the outcome or the target variable. And then you have the other variables, which is known as the independent variable, which is sometimes referred to as the predictor or maybe the covariate. Some people call it the attributable variable or the contributable variable, whichever way you would want to call it, that's fine. So we are just looking at establishing some cause and effect between these variables, and that gives us a cause comparison uh, research in quantitative research. And also we have a survey. Survey is something everyone knows about, you know, being able to collect information about attributes within a given population. You know, so survey is usually carried out. We have the online survey. We have the questionnaire system of survey. We have the polling type of survey, you know, where you get mails in your mailbox where asking you several questions. Even when it comes to even recent COVID-19, there were several surveys about uh, individual response to the COVID-19 vaccines. And these are examples you might think of. Then also we have the correlational quantitative research. 
Now correlation is coming from relationship. So this correlational research is actually looking at establishing relationship between the variables. So you might have a number of uh, 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 independent variables and you might want to know, are there any relationship between them? Let's say, for instance, if you look at high blood pressure, and then let's say the blood sugar level or glucose level. So you might want to know, is there any relationship between the high blood pressure and the uh, uh, blood sugar level or glucose? So you can't use this uh, correlational research to do uh, that. Then it is not only between independent variable, you can also establish a correlation between uh, dependent variable and then other independent variable as well. Then also we have experimental research. This, when we talk about experimental research, now what comes into our mind is an experiment. And when it comes to experiment, we say the investigators have an absolute control over the uh, uh, subjects in which, uh, which are participating in this research. And an example of experimental research you might know is the clinical trial. So every clinical trial is an example of experimental research you might think of. So now let us look at uh, an, a, a broad scope of the type of quantitative research. So over here, we have the conclusive and then the exploratory. Now I'll talk a little bit about the uh, exploratory before coming to the conclusive because it has more to. So when we talk about the exploratory uh, quantitative research, you are digging deep about a particular subject within a particular field of study. So uh, an example is of it is the pilot survey. Pilot survey is a clear example of when it comes to exploratory research. And exploratory research go uh, dig deep into finding so much information about the subjects as compared when it comes to uh, conclusive research. Now in the conclusive research, it is being split into two, which is the descriptive or the causal. Uh, now the descriptive is what we know about the case study research, the case series. We have the cross-sectional, the longitudinal or uh, cohort study, and then we have the ret uh, retrospective. Now we know the case study is the study of a single disease individual. Then the case series is studying multiple disease individuals. And then when we talk about the cross-sectional study, it's a study about the determinants of or attributes of individual within a population. And long longitudinal study look at actually uh, a follow-up study, right? And then just like a cohort study where you follow individual up. Now a cohort study actually give you uh, two uh, uh, types which we can have the retrospective and that of the uh, prospective. Now retrospective is usually called a historical data. And then prospective is when you have individuals and then you follow them up into the future to see, for instance, the individual may be exposed to a particular content. You follow them up into the future to see whether they, uh, the exposure leads to a disease. Then you have the causal uh, type of the conclusive uh, part of the uh, quantitative research, which again, it, we have the experimental and then the quasar experimental. Now the difference between these two is the fact that with the experimental, the investigator have a total control over the subject. For us in a quasar experimental, some the in investigator have some control over the subject and not a total control. And quasar experiment usually happen in a very large population where it is having a heterogeneous uh, features. So now let's look at some examples of quantitative uh, data. Like uh, Cotton uh, said, quantitative data talks about numerics or numbers. So you might think about money, time, speed, movement, height, uh, distance, length, volume, the BMI, uh, that's the uh, body mass index, the blood sugar level, the amount of uh, white blood cell, the hemoglobin level. Now, these are all examples of what quantitative uh, data. Now, let us look at why are we studying, uh, do we even need a quantitative research? Now, this is a, 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 a very four key reasons why quantitative research is useful. So to study the pattern or averages, now you might want to know that, let's say given a group of individual with high blood pressure, you might want to know what is the average high blood pressure for this age group. And you might also maybe want to study some patterns. Let's say there's a disease outbreak, for instance, COVID-19 disease outbreak. And then you might want to know what is the patterns in terms of uh, the changes in the number of individuals who are being uh, 
infected or diagnosed with COVID-19. So over time, you might want to then also to make prediction. Now that is a very key importance of uh, quantitative research because it is looking at establishing cause and effect. So you might want to use it in making what a prediction. So a prediction you might think of, for example, you might want to ask yourself that uh, does the glucose level of an individual predict the uh, blood pressure of the individual, which is an example. For instance, does the cholesterol level of an individual predict the blood pressure level of the individual? So these are some of the predictions you might want to make. And then also it tests the causal relationship. So what is the causal relationship? Does, uh, does glucose have impact on the blood pressure of an individual? Does cholesterol have impact on the blood pressure of the individual. So this is the causal relationship we want to establish. Then also to generalize the results to a wider a population. Now, more often, this research actually deals with sample rather than the entire population. So at the end of the day, we would want to actually base on the sample to make a generalization to the, to the entire population. And there is just an expansion of some of this importance. It allows us to assess the causal relationship and effects on the outcome variable then also uh, test the strength and significance of a phenomenon. So when we talk about the strength and significance of a phenomenon, you might want to know how significant does the uh, blood sugar level of an individual uh, impact the blood pressure of the individual. So for instance, how significant is the number of time an individual uh, undertake a physical activity impact the, uh, BI, uh, the body mass index? of the individual which lead to obesity. So these are some of the significant you might think. Then also uh, to measure the data and then also show results on the objective. Then to investigate the reliability and the accuracy of the outcome. That's what makes quantitative research more important. It allows you to be able to actually measure the accuracy. So if you look at those of you who might have learned a, a little bit about regression, it allows you to have something like the R square which is measuring the variation in the outcome variable, which is being explained by the independent variable. So what is this R square? The higher the R square you make, the more accurate in terms of it what prediction and it become very key in terms of, and the more reliable your uh, identify risk factors become. Then also it allows us to assess the relationship and then association between the uh, variables and the factors. Then also to make forecast or to make prediction. If you take linear regression, for instance, it allows us to make what prediction for the future, given the identify what risk factors, which is become very important. And then also to assess pattern and then add phenomenon over time. So now let us look at also furthermore on how to use quantitative research. Now there are basic procedures in terms of when it comes to making use of quantitative research. What are these procedures? The first procedure is to make observation about something unknown. Now, before you proceed with a quantitative research, the first thing you do is to make an observation. For instance, maybe you might be a, a medical doctor, and then you observe that people who walk in to and who walk into the uh, hospital and are being diagnosed by hypertension, most of them are the age aged group or the adult group, let's say 65 plus. This is the initial observation you make. So based on the observation, you might want to actually embark to investigate how true is this observation. Is it true that uh, hypertension is associated with the aged group? So this is the initial observation. Then you formulate the hypothesis. So based on the observation, now you can formulate the hypothesis. So the hypothesis, for instance, become, uh, let's say, uh, a hypertension is associated with what? Uh, the aged group. or people who are age, let's say 65 plus, are more likely to be di diagnosed with hypertension. So this becomes a hypothesis an individual may formulate. Then also you predict the outcomes. So before you proceed in, with your investigation, you should be able to know the outcome because you are looking at the outcome become less the disease. So for instance, if you look at hypertension, what outcome are we going to look at? We are looking at the blood pressure level of the individual that becomes the, the outcome. And that is what we are actually going to base on to test uh, and to perform our uh, further analysis or investigation. Then also, now you know your outcome. You know, let's say the blood pressure level is the outcome for the hypertension. Now you want to know, collect data about the blood pressure level. So you collect all necessary data 
which you, you think can contribute to what uh, the blood pressure level of an individual, which can lead to hypertension. So you might want to collect data on the glucose level, maybe the cholesterol level, maybe the number of times the individual actually exercise during the week or take part in physical activity. Then also, if now finally, after you have gathered your information, if, you, if your prediction is confirmed, verify the results and then draw a final conclusion. Now, if you're able to confirm your results, if you're able to validate the results and then have a higher accuracy, then you have to make your conclusion about the finding. Now, if it is not confirmed, then there is a need for you to formulate a new hypothesis. Perhaps your initial observation in which you based on to formulate your hypothesis is not actually uh, a good observation you made. Hence, you think of another different way to actually approach your uh, analysis. Now, let us look at, now you have an idea when it comes to quantitative research. Now let us look at what are, let's try to link the type of quantitative research to some examples you might want. So for instance, we have the descriptive quantitative research. So an example of it is for instance, if NIH survey 5,000 uh, 5, individuals who received COVID-19 uh, vaccine and then compiling a description of this individual uh, experience with the what? With the vaccine is an example of descriptive uh, and it's something, it's an ongoing investigation by several health departments. They want to know how the individuals, the vaccine is impacting individual. Then what about the correlational research of the quantitative? Now you would want to, for instance, study the relationship between the blood pressure and then the amount of blood sugar level or the amount of glucose intake for hypertension or patient. This allow you to be able to establish whether there's any relationship between the blood pressure level and then the amount of glucose level in the individual take leading to uh, hypertension. Mm -hmm. Then also we have the experimental. So testing whether or not an intervention or treatment prevents or reduce uh, disease. So an example is let's think about COVID-19. I'm using COVID-19 because it's a more recent disease. And I think that gives you a more clearer uh, understanding. So we have the COVID-19 vaccine, for instance. So before these companies came up with the vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson & Co., the first, what they wanted to know is whether their vaccine is capable of preventing an individual from being diagnosed with what? Uh, COVID-19. And it went through several clinical trials, which is basically an example of this experimental research. Then also we have the comparative, for instance, measuring the effect of plant dietary uh, meal on a diabetic patient for a year. Now, what makes this one a comparative research? You might want to know whether uh, one group of individual who have diabetes and another group of individual. So you put one group of the individual into a plant dietary meal, and then the other uh, just take ordinary meal. And then at the end of the day, you come to compare and see does those who were kept into a planned dietary meal have a reduction in uh, the incidence of uh, diabetes as compared to those who were not put in a, a planned dietary meal? So this becomes what a comparative research. And the comparative research, a case control study, for example, is an example of what a comparative research where you have the cases and then you have the control. Then also we have the statistical tools which you can actually use for a quantitative uh, data. Let's start with a descriptive uh, tool. One of the descriptive, some of the descriptive tools you can use for quantitative data is, we have the uh, measurement of the uh, center of the data, which is the mean, the median, and then the, what, the mode. So you would want to actually know uh, the center of the, what is the mean, what is the median of your uh, data. Then also you would want to measure the spread or the dispersion. Now you'd want to know what is the uh, variability within my data set. Is the, is the data skewed? Is, I mean, uh, in the standard deviation, you know, if you have a higher standard deviation, then it tells you there is more spread between your data points and then uh, the, uh, the mean value of your data. So if that happened, it means there's something have to be done. Then you might also want to, we have the interquartile, which is the difference between the third, third quarter and then the uh, first quarter, which is, they are all example. And then also we have the range. 
part of you when it comes to health research, they actually want you to make mention of the standard deviation and then also the range of the data. So if you go through several research articles, these are some of the important uh, descriptive you can see. Then also we have the five uh, number sum, which is actually can be seen from the, uh, from the box plot over here, which is also measuring the, uh, the minimum, the first quarter, the median, the third quarter, and then the maximum of the data, and as well as the outlier. So our outlier observation, our observation that distant itself from the entire data set. And when you have outlier within a data, it's something you have to take extra look at because it can influence your conclusions. Then also we have outliers. So these are how you can actually calculate outliers by using the first quartile, the interquartile rate, and the third quartile in calculating the outliers. So now another, let's look at some graphical display as a tool for quantitative research. You have the histogram, which you can actually use in assessing the distribution, the normal distribution of your data. Is the data skewed? Is the data, if it is skewed, is it right skewed or left skewed? If it is a uniform data, it means all the data points are the same. So you might want to check some of this information. Then also we have the box plot, which is also used in assessing again the distribution of the data, which performs similar role like the uh, histogram. Then we have the scatter plot, which is using assessing the relationship between two quantitative variables. So you might, for instance, we spoke about the blood sugar level and then the uh, the uh, 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 that's, uh, the blood pressure level of the individual. So you might want to plot a simple scatter plot to see their relationship. If are they having a positive relationship, a negative relationship, or they don't have any relationship, the scatter plot can give you uh, a visualization of it. Then also we have a line plot, which is actually also used in assessing relationship or pattern over time. So you might want to know perhaps how does the prevalence of the disease uh, changes over time? How does the prevalence of COVID-19 changes over time? We know there have always been ups and downs in terms of the number of individuals who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. And by using a line plot, it can actually help you assess how is this changing happening over time. Now, uh, let's also finally look at some statistical to or, or uh, methods that we can actually use in performing some inference when it comes to uh, quantitative analysis. One of them you can have is we have the uh, sample or one sample test. Yeah, for instance, if you made an observation, the fact that, uh, let's say, individuals uh, who are being diagnosed with, uh, let's say, hypertension, if you, you made an observation that their high blood pressure level, let's say, the diastolic is greater than 110, there's an observation you made. So you might want to proceed to perform a test to see whether this observation is true, that to prove or disprove it. Then also, you have a two sample test. Uh, there are two sample independent tests. So this type of test actually is having one variable, which is a, a, a categorical variable, which have a, in which the variables are independent. For instance, let's say you have one variable as male and female, and then you have another variable, which is a continual variable or the quantitative variable, as let's say the uh, blood pressure. So you might want to know if there are differences between the blood pressure level of a male and then the female. Let's say there are differences between the blood pressure level of the aged group and then the young group. You can use uh, the two sample test. Then we also have the ANOVA, which allow you to actually make several tests to know the mean differences between more than three uh, uh, independent uh, uh, categorical variables. Uh, that's if you have a categorical variable that is having more than two categories, then you can actually use the ANOVA to assess the mean differences. Then also we have the paired uh, uh, sample titers. The paired sample titers is very useful, particularly when it comes to, now it is a test which is uh, measured on the same subjects. So for instance, you uh, push uh, a group of individual through a physical uh, training and then you might want to know before and after the physical training, what is uh, their, uh, uh, maybe the, uh, the impact it have in terms of, let's say, their obesity level, which is their 
BMI level or maybe their blood pressure level that before you, the intervention and after the, what, the intervention. Then also you have the correlation coefficient, which is again using to measure the relationship. Now the correlation coefficient is having, it's between negative one and one. One means a perfect negative correlation. One, uh, uh, that's, negative one means a perfect negative correlation. One means a perfect positive correlation. And usually a correlation of greater than, people do consider correlation greater than six as a strong one correlation. And then zero means there is no correlation. Then you have this regression analysis again, which is going to allow you to measure the cause and effect between the dependent variable and then other independent one variable. Then you have the time series, which is allowing you to assess the trend over time, giving a number of what risk factors. So it is allowing you to make a prediction for an outcome variable, giving a number of what risk factor over time. So these are some of the tools which you can actually use in performing any quantitative uh, research you have. Okay, so I leave you to my colleague, Kosi. Thank you. Thank you, Lula. So we've just learned a whole lot about quantitative research and what it is and how it can be used. Uh, unfortunately, finding this research in databases is not always very a, a very simple task. Um, and so I'm gonna offer some suggestions and guidance on strategies and how, how to sort of identify these things and how to locate them within databases. Um, there are some databases which have built-in features, which allow you to really hone in on those and pull those up and be able to get use from them. But obviously there's many, many, many different kinds of database and some of them do not have those features. So I'm going to begin by discussing how best to search for quantitative research on databases that don't necessarily have the, those features, such as OneSearch or Google Scholar, uh, sort of the, the general keyword searching databases. And that's kind of how I'll refer to those. Uh, when you don't have the ability to search for something as a subject or as a, as a, 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 as a specific type of limiter, then we're gonna be using keyword searches. And so the first keyword that comes to mind is the one that I see most frequently used by many of the students I work with, and that is to enter quantitative. Um, and this is not uh, 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 this is not without its worth. Using quantitative as a keyword will bring back some results, especially that first page of results. At first, you know, the most relevant ones will be helpful. However, it can be somewhat problematic because it will bring back. You know, a lot of time when we're using keyword searches, we're essentially asking for every article or resource with that word in it. And that obviously is not always going to be very helpful. So instead, I suggest considering related terms. Uh, quantitative is kind of used as a catch-all. So using terms like validity, variance, correlation, uh, and statistical analysis can be extremely helpful in, in reducing your results to those specific types of uh, research. Statistical analysis in particular is one that I find to be very helpful. Another thing to consider while you're using these databases as a, a keyword searching is how these, how, these re how this research is gathered. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, polls, questionnaires, and surveys can be an extremely helpful way to sort of make sure you're getting that gathering method in the results that you're getting back. And as Lahua mentioned, there's also specific tools used in quantitative analysis. Uh, searching with these as keywords can also be quite helpful. Terms such as t-test, ANOVA can be quite useful. Regression analysis in particular, again, is something that it's very specific, but it will bring back considerable amounts of results, all using that specific type of uh, analysis. And so, as I mentioned, those are the keyword searching strategies I, I tend to employ, but there are other databases which have more robust features and allow us to really focus on specific types of research. And I'm going to uh, uh, pull up a browser now, and we're gonna take a look at some of these databases in real time. Okay. So what we're looking at right here is Sinal Plus with full text. Uh, this is a medical and nursing database. It is very commonly used and it probably looks somewhat familiar and will again when we get to the next database. Uh, 
Now, all of the strategies I've already suggested are perfectly usable here in keyword searches. We see we have these three windows on the top where we can certainly enter in the terms we're searching for. I would recommend rather than leaving this at select a field, which will look through the entire article, you might decide you want to say, look for, if I'm searching for say variance, I'm gonna have much greater success if I'm searching in say just the abstracts for the term variance rather than the entire article. Uh, those keyword searches work great here, but like I said, there's also some other functions. One thing we can do is scroll down to publication type right here. This publication type limiter obviously has a large number of uh, uh, options in here, and some of these are going to be quite useful to us. Things like clinical trial, and I, I can also hold down control and select as many of these as I like. And I might say clinical trial and randomized controlled trial and uh, statistics. And so once that I have these selected, I can just scroll to the bottom and click search and be given everything they have in these this database that fall under those publication types. Or I might choose to go back up and enter in keywords that are going to steer these results a little bit towards my topic and not just the type of research that we're looking for. Uh, the publication type has a lot of options in there. Some of them are going to be more helpful than others. But there's also something of a time saver. And forgive me, I'm going to get out of that for a moment. And if I scroll down a slight half page more, we see there's also a checkbox for randomized controlled trials. This selecting this is going to make sure that any results we get back are going to be featuring randomized controlled trials. And like I said earlier, I don't need to even enter keywords. I can start my search looking for randomized controlled trials. Ah, and normally I wouldn't get that message. So give me just a moment here. I select it here and search. It should stop and think for a moment and then bring us back 141,000 randomized controlled trials. So I definitely recommend using some keywords in addition to that because these will be about every topic they can possibly find. Going back to the main page, uh, I've shown you a few of these limiters that are here on this main, main uh, advanced search page, which is the landing page for this database. But there are also other options. And in this case, I'm talking specifically about using subject terms. As I mentioned, when we use a keyword, we're generally searching in either the whole article or a specific part of the article for that term. However, when I check this box, suggest subject terms, suddenly this database is not no longer looking for articles. It's looking for medical subject headings that it can use to apply to these articles. And in this case, I might try something very general like quantitative. And when I click search, it's not going to give me a list of articles with the word quantitative, but it's rather going to give me a list of uh, uh, subjects that we can use. And we see right at the top, it's actually telling us quantitative studies is what we prefer to use in this database. So I can click on this and be taken to information all about quantitative studies and get a look at that there. And as you can see, it sort of falls under the hierarchy of study design, which is, is useful. But what I can also do is checkbox, check this box right next to quantitative studies. And when I do that, we see on the right side of the screen, we have a whole bunch of subheadings open up, or I can just begin to search the database. And when I do that, now it's giving us all of the quantitative studies that they have listed. And obviously we see there's only 31,000 of these, which is a lower number than we saw of the randomized controlled trials. But it's important to think about when we're using these subject headings, that they're focusing on the act of quantitative research as much as using it within the article themselves. So they'll be weighing different me methods of analysis and focusing on that as a subject as much as a research method. Um, okay, so we are now looking at APA Psych Info, which is a uh, uh, psych and mental health database focusing on, on, on that side of the medicine. Now, we saw a bunch of varieties in, in CINAHL Plus of different ways we can narrow these down. Fortunately for us, AP Psych Info actually has a much more pertinent uh, limiter in here, and that is under methodology. So once I'm here, I can look under methodology and we see a number of different types of, of methodologies listed here, which are helpful, but I can scroll all the way to the bottom and we see we have qualitative and quantitative studies. So I can select quantitative study and then click search. And that's going to bring us to the near 2 million results uh, uh, that are falling under the heading of quantitative studies. 
Now, obviously, we would want to use keywords to narrow these down a little bit further. But one thing we can do, one thing that I'm very excited about in, within APA Sec Info is that in addition to looking up methodologies, we can also look up tests and measures. So this allows us to find uh, uh, multiple articles using the same methodology that are also happening to use the same tests and measures, which make them even more comparable and uh, uh, easier to use in analysis. Um, the last database I'd like to show you for this is PubMed. And PubMed obviously looks quite a bit different than the other two databases. And it is just as usable as a keyword search database as CINAHL Plus is, as APA Psych Info is. However, CINAHL Plus does have a few uh, helpful uses as well. Now, like I said, we can use the keywords, but just like in uh, CINAHL Plus, I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna select Mesh Database. And this allows me to use the medical subject headings to my advantage rather than using keywords. And so in this case, I, I might try searching for quantitative. However, I already know that that won't yield any results. So I might try searching for statistics. And this isn't perfect, but what we do find is statistics as a topic. And when I click statistics as a topic, this gives us a lot more information. It tells us about the general uh, uh, definition here. And we are given subheadings as well. But if I scroll down, we're given a much better uh, uh, idea of what is included under statistics as a topic. Now, some of these are not necessarily entirely quantitative, but we are seeing quite a few of these that we saw with uh, when Wuhu was discussing the, the different types of quantitative research. For instance, we see regression analysis right here. And so we might choose to focus on this by selecting on it. And now we're taking to a very similar page, only focusing on regression analysis. And if I'm interested in pulling up these results, I can go over here to the search builder, click add to search builder, and then search. And I've gotten back about a half a million results based on using uh, regression analysis. Now, one other thing that we can do here is continue to narrow these down by article type. We see that we have a number of different article types available to us. However, we can also just go into additional filters and add more. And we see one thing you might notice is that there's a number of different clinical trial options here. Now, these are all clinical trials in specific phases. However, there's also clinical trial on the main page, and that's going to include all of those at once. So don't feel like you need to uh, pull more in. Uh, clinical trial tends to be very illustrative and cover a lot of those phases as well. And so as you can see, we can narrow these down quite easily that way. And so those are the, the specific databases I wanted to show using this uh, uh, type of search. However, keep in mind, the keyword searches are going to be useful as well, and they can be used across just about any database you find. I'm going to get us back into the PowerPoint, and I will turn it over to Lua. OK, so uh, now uh, my colleague Cotton have actually show you the various databases in which you have to actually go to to be able to collect a quantitative data. Now let us look at more something on qualitative data. So again, he's going to start on uh, qualitative data. Thank you. I just needed a quick break. Uh, so qualitative research is, is, is the next uh, uh, type of research we're looking at here. And obviously, what is it? So qualitative research, it's an umbrella phase that describes many research methodologies often used to discover and gain an in-depth knowledge of individual experiences, thoughts, and opinions. And for me personally, I, the experiences, thoughts, and opinions is really sort of what underlines what, what I think of when I think of qualitative research. And so what's an example of that? Uh, how, how is clinical depression experienced by members of different ethnicities? Uh, this is something, again, think of thought, think of experiences, uh, uh, perceptions, beliefs, things like that. So how is it gathered? Again, this is a great way to think about qualitative research or quantitative research and, and the methods in which this data is collected. And uh, unlike quantitative data, a lot of qualitative research is collected through observation, uh, through interviews, through focus groups. Think these are, uh, uh, along with surveys, open-ended surveys, these are open-ended. So they allow participants to, to voice, you know, in their own words, what they're experiencing and, and what their experiences are. Uh, occasionally, Secondary research is also used in qualitative research in the form of text, video, images uh, as well. 
And so what are characteristics of qualitative research? Uh, one, as I just mentioned, would be the open-ended responses to questions, uh, being given uh, free language responses, uh, uh, certainly indicative of, of qualitative research. Uh, data collection is also frequently done in a natural setting, as opposed to say in a laboratory. So if I'm conducting a workplace observation, I'm going to be in the workplace observing uh, rather than in a different setting. And typically qualitative research works to build a narrative showing a holistic picture of the issue. Okay. Okay, all right, thank you. So now, uh, now you know about what a qualitative research is. Now let us look at what are some of the types of qualitative research. Now, if you think about uh, performing a qualitative research, what should you do? Now, one qualitative research we, uh, we have is the one-on-one -on -one interview. Maybe something most of you might have been doing, but you are not aware that is an example of qualitative research. If you go to the hospital and then you are on one-on-one -on -one with the medical doctor, now he do collect some information from you and whatever information is collecting from you from this one-on-one -on -one, uh, interview is an example of a qualitative uh, research you can uh, get. Then also we have a uh, focus group. Now also focus group is also another type of qualitative uh, research tool we can actually use in gathering qualitative information or data. Again, it's also something most of you are already engaged in. An example, the uh, project group, project group assignments, and then others you do engage yourself. It's an example of uh, focus group uh, research work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, mostly focus group may entail about five to 10 individuals who actually sit down and dissect deeply into issues relating to uh, health, uh, dissecting into health issues. Then also we have the ethnographic research. Maybe it is a type of research most of you might not be uh, fully aware of. So this type of research is actually focused on, uh, this type of research is actually focused on a specific geographic area. Now we know, for instance, if you think about, let's say, uh, Ebola, we know Ebola outbreak happened in Republic of Congo, somewhere in Republic of Congo. And within that geographic area, they were able to contain it. And then researchers actually embark on research, knowing what actually happened and gathering information regarding this Ebola. There is an example of what uh, ethnographic research where it is focused on a specific ge geographic area or environment. Then we also have a case study. So this a case study research is actually a study which is focusing on a particular disease individual. Now, in a case study research, it's something which is actually focused on diseases that are uncommon. For instance, if you take a disease like uh, autism, autism is an example of a disease which is not very common in our society. But however, given that people do get diagnosed with uh, autism, sometimes researchers might want to focus on this autism individual to know more about, I mean, their progresses in terms of certain characteristics or features that comes up in uh, as their diseases progresses or they seek for treatment. Then also uh, record keeping. Okay, I know everyone knows about uh, record keeping. Record keeping at the hospital is an example of quantitative research. If you go to the hospital, your information about the type of insurance you are using and then any other more information which has been uh, uh, collected about this individual is an example of uh, quantitative research, which is also being used in the health science. Then this is the very quantitative research in which I think everyone knows, which is the observational uh, research. Now this observational research comes with what, when we say observational research, what we actually mean by observational research, we know it is a research in which the investigator or the researcher have no influence on the subject. It's not able to manipulate the subjects, right? Or what he does is, is just stand by and then collect the data or observe whatever is going on. Survey is an example of observational research, cross-sectional study in which uh, uh, interviewing and then others, these are all examples of what observational study, which actually is being carried more often when it comes to gathering information for health uh, research. Now let us also look at some example of uh, qualitative data. 
So we might, we have a verbal or written feedback. Now, one example of qualitative uh, data is a verbal or written feedback. So what do you mean by a verbal or written feedback? Sometimes you might want to know feedback of about patients, right? Feedback of people who have been diagnosed with a specific, I mean, diseases. Feedback of individual who took, let's say, a specific type of uh, a vaccine for COVID-19, let's say, either the Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer. You might want to have certain feedback. Was it having any complication on the patients and then others? These are all examples of uh, quantitative research, uh, qualitative research feed, uh, examples you can get. Then also we have a uh, narrative. So sometimes more often, if you are sick and you go to the hospital, what happened? It's an example of one-to-one -one interview, which is a type of qualitative research. But what happened is you as a patient, you start narrating your story, telling the doctor, okay, I, I wake up, I was having a headache, I was having this and that and that. And based on your narrative or your narration, the doctor is able to tell perhaps maybe you are diagnosed with this or maybe you have to go to the lab for further tests and then others. And there's a, a narrative type of example of qualitative mm -hmm. research. Now, with, when it comes to narrative, we have the first-hand na 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 narrative which involves a direct experience that the individual himself. Then we have the second hand, which involves a person who is watching from elsewhere. Perhaps maybe a parent may send their child or daughter to the hospital, and then they would have to tell the doctor, okay, this is, uh, this is what my child is experiencing. Or, or maybe for some reason, let's say all of a sudden somebody collapsed, and then the person might not know what happened before the incident uh, uh, happened. So when they get to the hospital, whoever was uh, somebody who was standing by and then saw whatever happened before this incident happened might want to give a narration. And there's an example of a, a qualitative reason. Then also we have a third party. Now, sometimes there are certain, perhaps maybe there are certain diseases. You may have certain medical doctors who have some experience in terms of handling such uh, diseases, or maybe they have uh, uh, had encounter with individual who were diagnosed with such a disease. So they might be in, invited to give certain narration of how uh, perhaps uh, to go about in terms of uh, gathering information about this disease. And that's, again, a qualitative uh, example of data. Mm -hmm. Then we have visual images. I think once I talk of visual images, the first thing come to your mind is X-ray, right? X-ray is a visual image. So you go, I mean, if you have any, you might want to go for scanning for maybe mammogram or others. These are all examples of what virtual images you might see, which is an example of qualitative data you might have. Then also we have other description like the appearance, beauty, belief, uh, uh, capabilities, choices, color, desirability, distinguish, encouragement, your feelings, and then uh, a, a fitness level, significance, smell, strength. All these are examples of uh, qualitative data you can think of. So now let us think about why do we even need a qualitative data? Now in a qualitative data, it actually helps to explore, go deep and then seek for, to understand. So in a given population, you might want to understand what is actually happening in the population. Let's say for instance, COVID-19, there was a COVID-19 outbreak and researchers want to know more about what is happening within the population. And what are some of the things they might want to consider? Okay, within the age group, which group are more at risk of being infected by COVID-19? Now, within the age group, which group are less uh, 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 at risk of being infected by COVID-19? And even apart from the age group, you might want to think of, let's say, if you take the state of California and the state of, let's say, Tennessee, which of these states is at high incidence in terms of the COVID-19. These are some of the things you might want to dig deep to understand. And then by understanding, it helps us to come up with certain policy intervention in handling such uh, diseases. Mm -hmm. So to assess the frequency of traits and then characteristics of a particular what, data case. Yeah, so through qualitative research, we are able to actually know how frequently is this happening. So. Once we talk about frequently, the very uh, term in which it's quite used often 
in a health is prevalence. So how prevalence is the disease within our population? If the prevalence uh, lead, uh, the prevalence can actually give us a clue of whether this particular disease is even, let's say, endemic, is it epidemic, is it a pandemic, right? So COVID-19 became a pandemic, worldwide pandemic disease because it's what? Because it is having a high prevalence rate and it is all over around the globe, hence it was called a, what? a pandemic. So this is how we can actually measure these things, uh, the usefulness. Then also, now what you should know about the uh, qualitative research, how important is it is quantitative research can actually be represented in a qualitative form. Now think about it this way, for instance, let's say you might want to say that, oh, okay, age is a risk factor for hypertension or maybe high blood pressure. But wait a minute, if you say age is a risk factor, how sure are you? In order to go a little bit deep in which qualitative research gives you that strength is to know the age group. So what about if I categorize the age group into different categories? Let's say individuals less than 24, let's say 24 to 35, maybe between uh, uh, 45 and let's say 65, 65 plus. So now I put them into groups. Now it allows me to really deeply understand which actually group is at high risk. So qualitative research actually gives us this information. So at the end of the day, you are able to know that, okay, although age is a risk factor for hypertension, but wait a minute, it's not all group of age, but instead perhaps out of your research, individual 65 plus are more at risk of being diagnosed with let's say hypertension as compared to those that are less. And that gives you a more insightful information to be able to make a decision that is still making a very strong policy intervention. Mm -hmm. Then also you have to investigate connection association among categorical variables. Now, through uh, a qualitative research, you are able to actually establish association between categorical variables. So for instance, you might want to know that, okay, you ask people, uh, you, you were able to actually group, let's say the, body mass index of an individual into two, where you have one group considered to be obese and then the other group considered not to be obese. Quite often, if you have a body mass index of greater than or equals to, let's say, 30, you are being considered as obese. So you have these two groups. Then you might want to maybe establish uh, the fact that that's maybe the cholesterol level of an individual have impact on uh, uh, the obesity. Or maybe is there any relationship between the cholesterol level of an individual and then obesity? Then also you have this cholesterol level also grouped into categories. Or maybe does age categories influence have any association with individuals who are obese? So these are some of the associations you can actually come up with through a qualitative research. Then also to assess the extent or the magnitude of the risk factor or association of attributes on the outcome variable. Now, for instance, if I come to you and then I tell you that, look, not having enough physical activity is associated with obese. And perhaps there's a research which is actually backing it. And that's a good information based on the research. Let's say there's some evidence out there. But then it even become more informative if I tell you that, okay, uh, uh, not having physical activity have increased risk of being obese. Now, the first statement was not having physical activity is associated with obese. But now I'm telling you, it has an increased risk of being obese if you don't have a physical activity. That's also another, even a more important information than the first one. Then also another thing is, okay, now I'm not only telling you not having physical activity has increased risk of being obese, but then, not having physical activity have, let's say, 60% increased risk of being obese. Now I'm being more specific. Then it tells you that, wait a minute, if I don't have physical activity, I have 60% chances of being obese. Now it gives you more information to actually plan your life. 
But if I tell you not having physical activity, have let's say 5% of being obese, someone will say, oh, okay, give me a break. I will eat all the kind of sandwich I want to eat. And I'm okay because it's just 5% chance. And perhaps I don't fall within that 5% group. So there's how important a qualitative research can actually be, giving you a more deeper information to be able to actually make certain conclusions. Then also let us look at how to use a qualitative research. Now, qualitative research can take a variety of forms. Now, one of the forms is uh, content analysis. Now, there's something we are all pretty much used to, which is actually performing certain hypotheses and then reviewing the team or information that emerged after categorizing or what, summarizing or tabulating the data. And there's something which is quite used more often. So maybe you might not know the analysis you perform out of a qualitative data, Maybe you might not know it's actually a content analysis, and that's an example of how a qualitative research can be used. Then also we have the framework analysis, which involves organizing the data, the team, uh, uh, then coding, charting, and then mapping and interpreting them. Now, this framework analysis is even also more important when it comes to particular, if you take an example, for instance, mapping. Now, when the, uh, uh, there is a COVID-19 outbreak, when uh, 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 policymakers are coming up with some policy intervention in terms of, let's say, how to distribute the vaccine. Now, you wouldn't want to distribute a vaccine or send more vaccine to an environment where the incidence of the COVID-19 or the prevalence of COVID-19 is very low as compared to an environment where the incidence of the COVID-19 is much. So you use mapping to be able to locate which area is the prevalence of the COVID-19 high. Then more medications or vaccine is being sent there, and that actually will be able to help to reduce the incidence of the what, COVID-19. So there's an example of the framework analysis. And then also we have a case study. Again, case study I did explain earlier on to dig deep into understanding a particular disease individual and to learn more about that disease. Then also more on how to use uh, 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 qualitative research. Let us take an example. For instance, let's say a health insurance company is asking the question, why are customers leaving? And to restate the question, you say, which factors are causing the what, customers to leave? So some of the quanti uh, qualitative research you might want to review is uh, asking uh, reasons why customers are discontinuing the service, which is an example of qualitative research. Then also you ask your, uh, the staff, why do they think customers are leaving, which also gives you a qualitative research. Then also you look at past experience, a uh, customer, a uh, client, and then communication prior to what leaving. So you would want to know about some of the complaints of the customers and their communication prior to what leaving, which also gives you some qualitative research. Then also you might want to survey current our customers to determine their level of satisfaction. How satisfied are they with this type of insurance? If it is a public insurance, if it is a private insurance, how satisfied are they? It gives you an, a qualitative information. Then also feedback mechanism to collect uh, uh, ideas and then co uh, comments from customers, uh, staff, and other stakeholders. So you might also want to look about and then also collect information. For instance, some information you might collect, for instance, when it comes to a health insurance company, you might want to know why is this health insurance company actually uh, surviving or, uh, or progressing or advancing, you know? So you might want to, and these, are, these become an example of stakeholders you might want to get some information from. Mm -hmm. Then also some uh, uh, company culture evaluation. So you might want to evaluate the culture of the company. Now let us look at another illustration using COVID-19. So which is a bigger question in which some of you might have asked yourself, why are people refusing to take COVID-19 vaccine? Now you know COVID-19, we know the number of deaths COVID-19 have caused, how fast is it? Uh, the number of individuals who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 over the years. And now, thankfully, there have been a vaccine, but people are still refusing the vaccine. So the question is, why are they refusing? So you might want to know which risk factors influence the likelihood of people receiving vaccine, or which risk factors influence the likelihood of people refusing the vaccine. 
And the qualitative data you can actually look at is people feeling about being vaccinated. Yeah, so perhaps there could be some reason behind uh, why people are not taking the vaccine. So you have to actually assess their feelings, their emotions, and then based on which you can use it for some certain policy intervention. Then also people feeling about the likelihood of contracting COVID-19. Now, for instance, if I think that the, the likelihood of contracting COVID-19 is very minimal for, uh, for the youth, then the youth are less likely to take COVID-19 anyway. And if it is, the risk, is very, the risk of contracting COVID-19 is very high for the aged group, then it's more likely you'll get the aged group uh, taking the COVID-19 vaccine. And there's an example of qualitative data you can actually look at the feeling of uh, people, the likelihood of people contracting COVID-19. Then also you look at individual perception about the vaccine type. So we have different type of vaccine. What are individual uh, perception? Perhaps what are some of the uh, uh, complications after people have taken uh, the vaccine? What are some of the adverse effects after people taking vaccine? Because there were so many conspiracy theories, particularly when it, it came to some of these uh, 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 types of vaccine when uh, initially they discovered the vaccine. So you might want to know more about that. Then also a survey of people who have vaccinated to determine their level of satisfaction and then their health condition. So there is also be able, if a lot of people who took the vaccine is actually given a high level of satisfaction, then based on that data, you can use it as a motivation to get a lot more people to also get vaccine. If um, more people out who were vaccinated are saying, oh, they are having a very good health condition, they are having excellent health condition, then based on it, you can use it as an, a means to what motivate people to actually get vaccinated. So this is an example of how useful, how to use a qualitative data. Then also feedback mechanism or to collect ideas or comments from vaccine manufacturers, uh, medical staffs, and then other what, stakeholders. So you also want to know more information about, I mean, it's, it's always good that vaccine companies are very open in terms of even material that go into making that vaccine. And that actually helped increase the trust the public come to have in that one, vaccine. And they, they should be able to spell out the side effects of the vaccine so that people know if I'm taking the vaccine, these are the possible side effects I should get. So getting some of these feedbacks and mechanism from even the manufacturing companies is actually very important and is one of the ways of using a qualitative research. Then also culture, uh, the individual culture evaluation about vaccination. Now during this COVID-19 uh, vaccination distribution, Sometimes you might hear about people say, my religion doesn't allow me to take COVID uh, 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 to be vaccinated, or maybe my culture does not allow me to be vaccinated. Now it's very important to actually look into some of this culture values and then to be able to evaluate it and then to use it for policy intervention. Now also more on, now let us look at uh, uh, qualitative data depends on problems uh, you are working on now. Most of the qualitative information depends on the problem you are working on and the hypothesis you actually come to formulate. So for example, one hypothesis you might actually formulate on how to work with a qualitative data on COVID-19 is if individual, uh, if an individual uh, vaccinated for COVID-19, what is the likelihood of the individual uh, contracting other variant of COVID-19? So assuming through this, we are able to discover that when an individual take COVID-19 vaccine, then the probability or likelihood of the individual contracting other variant of, uh, uh, of infection or COVID-19 is very minimal, then it's even also become a motivation for, for people to go for COVID-19. And that's how you can structure your hypothesis to be able to investigate. And also it's having hypertension associated with depression. So there's also one way to actually formulate your a question whenever you are embarking on what uh, qualitative research, you might want to know that individuals who are actually having, who are depressed, if you have people who are depressed and people who are having hypertension, you might want to know that, is it necessary that every individual who is depressed is at risk of uh, getting uh, hypertension? Mm -hmm. Then also, does the type of insurance enrolled depend on the level of, let's say, income, gender, or uh, education. So sometimes you might want to know the type of insurance patients or an individual 
is using. And is this type of insurance influenced by the level of income of the individual? Is it gen so qualitative research actually allow us to assess disparities in generally, if you actually want to assess the disparities within a population, then you have to make use of what qualitative research because it watered down or, and go deep into all information you might need in terms of even assessing disparities within a population. And also do associate uh, do sociodemographic factors influence surgical treatment of lung cancer? So this is also another way to formulate your hypothesis whenever you are searching uh, qualitative research. Then also we have what factors are associated with heart-related what diseases. So we might have a heart-related disease, cardiovascular disease. So you might want to know what factors are associated with it. And that is also one way to actually go about with a qualitative research to be able to gather your data. Now let us look at some statistical tool for qualitative research. Let us start with descriptive. Now qualitative research doesn't have so many descriptive. Usually uh, the descriptive is just uh, minimal. So we have the frequency table, which gives you the count, the percentages, the relative frequency, the proportion, or the prevalence of the what of the disease. And then we also have the cross tabulation. So again, cross tabulation allows you to be able to again assess the percentages, then the attributes by rows and then columns. Mm -hmm. Then also you have the mode of the uh, mode which represent the most uh, frequently uh, the most frequent attribute within that particular qualitative data. So now let us look at some visualization for qualitative data. So you have bar chart which are bar plot, which is actually used mostly in visualizing a qualitative data. And it give it is being used, uh, it give it display the percentages and then the counts of the attributes. Then you can also make use of the bar chart, which is also played similar role that like the bar chart, giving a certain percentages or the outcomes of the attributes we are investigating. Then also we have the dot plot also performing similar uh, role like the pie chart and then the bar chart, which is again also looking at the distributions in terms of the frequencies using counts. Mm -hmm. Then we have the classification plot, which is not actually uh, quite often used, but however, it is used in a more advanced uh, method, which is we have what is called the decision analysis. So you might want to know individual diagnosed with COVID-19, those who are not diagnosed with COVID-19, the likelihood of contracting COVID-19, the likelihood of not contracting COVID-19, their age group. So decision analysis actually gives you the nod and then the branch to be able to make traces, to be able to make uh, come up with conclusion. And there's a more advanced way to actually investigate. So uh, finally, let us look at some inferences in terms of uh, this. So an inference you can actually perform, we have the uh, test, uh, test for sample proportion. It's a one way to actually perform an inference for uh, qualitative research. Maybe you might want to know that the proportion of uh, individual, uh, let's say the proportion of a male uh, uh, contracting COVID-19 is higher than the proportion of a female contracting COVID-19. So you might want to do that based on testing for sample proportion. Then quite often what is most used often is the chi-square test, which is allow us to ask, make the uh, bivariate inferences that between two categorical variables. So you might want to know the association or relationship between two categorical variables. And using a chi-square test is one inference you can actually perform when it comes to qualitative data. Then also you have a logistic regression, which is even a bigger one. And this, the one which is used more often when it comes to assessing a uh, 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 or investigating into qualitative research, giving an outcome variable and then other independent or covariates. And logistic regression is also actually help you to be able to assess disparities within what a uh, disease, uh, within a disease outbreak or an outcome given the risk factors or the covariates. So, okay, so that's it. So I'll call my colleague Cotton to actually send you through some of the database which you can actually use in assessing this qualitative research. So over to you. Thank you. Okay, so getting back to uh, the, the searching of the databases and how best to sort of locate these types of data, 
uh, we find ourselves again first looking at the general databases that don't necessarily have features which allow us to zero in on qualitative data. And so we start with the keyword searches. And as I mentioned before, qualitative uh, is probably one of the ones I see most frequently in the students that I'm working with. Uh, the, the Using qualitative as a keyword tends to work better than using something like quantitative uh, because it, for whatever reason, is a little more specific, but it's still unreliable. Uh, and it still will bring back results that might not fall exactly what you're looking, will fall into exactly what you're looking for. Uh, again, consider alternatives that are related to the type of research. For instance, a keyword like attitudes, uh, interviews, beliefs, perceptions, experiences. Uh, these are largely going to bring back results using qualitative research and data. And again, just as in the quantitative, uh, thinking of how it's gathered and using those gathering methods as a, a, a keyword can be useful as well. So using a keyword such as observation or interviews or focus groups or surveys, uh, uh, again, open-ended, can be quite useful. These are also included as subject headings in a lot of the databases as well. So it's something to consider depending on which database you're using, something like Google Scholar will not have that option. However, if you're using uh, a search engine or a database such as OneSearch, then you will be getting subjects back as listed as focus groups. Once again, the uh, specific analysis tools can also be useful. So thinking of using chai test as a search term or logistic regression as a search term or a search phrase will bring back results that are using those specific tools most of the time. But like I did earlier, uh, we have the general databases, which are particularly uh, uh, subject to using keyword searches. We also have the other databases, which have features built in to help us locate those. And once again, I'm going to bring up a browser and uh, I will open up these databases as well. So we'll start with the same three that we just looked at with qualitative. And on CINAHL Plus, as I mentioned, uh, there's a few different options. We can scroll down to the uh, document type, but first we can also look at the clinical queries. Amongst these clinical queries, we do have the option to look at qualitative uh, uh, inquiries under a number of different sensitivity, specificity, and balance. So that is always a, a, an option to, to start with. We can also look at, again, the publication type here. And we can see right away uh, something like anecdote. Anecdote is obviously going to be focusing on experience, experience and uh, can provide some qualitative data as well. We'll also see things like, these are very hard to scroll through, but we see biography is in there. There's also going to be case study uh, right here. And interview will also show up in just about every possible document type. And so we can use those as well. But once again, I also do like to make use of these subject headings here. Uh, instead of using the keywords, I'm going to select suggest subject terms once again. And in this case, uh, I can search with qualitative. And when I do that, we see qualitative validity and beneath that qualitative studies. Now, qualitative studies is interesting because when I click on this link, it will take us to a hierarchy as we've seen in a few other areas. But in this case, unlike uh, quantitative studies, qualitative studies has a number of specific types of qualitative research beneath it. This allows us to focus on that exact type of research. For instance, if I'm interested in phenomenological research, I can check that. And we will see the subject subheadings open up in here. However, in this case, I'm going to ignore those and just search the database. And upon doing that, we get back the 271 uh, phenomenological research studies in this database. And as with before, we can also continue to narrow these down. If I wanna use some of the features on that first main page, I can click on show more right beneath the publication date. And it gives me all of those options from the first page. And so I might say, well, I'm looking for case studies, anecdotes, and, uh, interviews. And once I have those selected, I can click search. And we actually already had those in here. So we see publication type, anecdote, 
case study are both selected. So that is another way we can integrate both the subject headings and those features on the main page when we first log in. Okay, going over to APA Psych Info, once again, we have a much clearer use of the limiters here because as you may remember, we have a methodology option here. And under methodology, at just like with quantitative, we can also select qualitative. And from here, we can certainly search and get back every possible qualitative study in this uh, database, all 273,000. However, we would probably want to use keywords in here as well to get greater use out of these. Um, once again, we can also narrow these down by tests and measures as well, just to get a better idea of what they might be using. With PubMed, we're going to have a lot of the same uh, uh, functionality we had when searching for quantitative research. Uh, we can certainly use keywords, as I mentioned before, but we also might use the, the subject headings to our advantage, just as I do in the other databases. Now, once we're in the subject headings here, I'm still going to search for qualitative. And the top result we get back is qualitative research. We also see some very, very related uh, subjects coming in after this, such as focus groups, uh, which can be useful as well. But if I select qualitative research, it once again brings us to a hierarchy where we can observe this and then add it into our search builder and conduct a search. Getting back 73,000 results. Another thing we might try is to use those keywords that I was mentioning earlier, not just to search as keywords, but to search for subjects as well. So if I go into the mesh database again, and I search for something like attitudes, we can start to get a few relevant uh, uh, subject headings, such as attitude of health personnel, attitude to health, and attitude to death. Uh, these can be combined with other subject headings uh, or just used on their own. For instance, if I select attitude to health, and search with this in my search builder, we get back a, almost a half million uh, articles just describing uh, either patients or practitioners' attitudes towards health. And once again, we can use the article type limiter here to continue narrowing these down. Now, none of these, uh, most of the, the options available here are more tied to quantitative research. But if I go into additional filters, it gives me the option to add several different types of articles. And so I say I might want to add, say, interviews and uh, case studies or case reports, excuse me. Uh, there's observational studies, there's interviews, there's uh, uh, several different options here, as well as personal narratives. And so I might select all these. Now, when I click show, this is not going to change the results, but we can see that these options have now been added to our article type options on the left. So if I am looking for uh, articles about attitudes towards health and they're focusing primarily on interviews, I can select interview and then that will update itself to 843 results. And we would probably continue to narrow these down by date and maybe a few other options as well, but that obviously puts us on a much better start towards looking through these results. Okay, so those are the three databases again that I wanted to show you. Those have the most robust features for looking for these. However, some of these you will find do have some lighter limiters. Uh, something like Science Direct can be useful in, say, narrowing down just to uh, research articles. And then on top of that, you can use some of the keyword strategies that I mentioned earlier. And with that, we are at the end of our presentation. And so I'd like to open the floor up to any questions for myself or Professor Mamadou, and hopefully we can answer uh, anything you might have. Oh. We do have a, a raised hand. Uh, Roxanne, if you can type your question into the chat, we'll, we'll certainly answer it. But unfortunately, we can't turn the sound on right now. Um, that is, by the way, completely my fault. I uh, accidentally touched a screen that was not listed. <clears throat> so our question is, do you have any tips on how to conduct culturally sensitive analysis when it comes to conducting qualitative analysis? I, I'm going to defer to the expert here. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to conducting a uh, culturally uh, sensitive analysis, there is uh, actually, I don't have so much in-depth knowledge when it comes to culturally uh, sensitive analysis, but what I can say is 
uh, the fact that to, in order to perform a culturally sensitive analysis, sometimes you need to actually speak to a lot of experts because it's something sensitive. And then and getting hold of people's sensitive information is something which, I mean, you might want to take a very close look at. So I think when it comes to sensitive, uh, culturally uh, sensitive analysis, I think it's something my research bagger is actually not too much focused on culturally sensitive analysis. So in this case, I would advise that I think speaking to someone who is more expert when it comes to handling culturally sensitive uh, analysis research will, will be key. But however, it's also a form of a, a qualitative uh, analysis. And then uh, given that it is sensitive, it means you are actually gathering information more about individual uh, issues about individual, which is more sensitive, right? So like I said, I think it's something you might want to speak to an expert on this, particularly when it comes to culturally sensitive analysis. You have something to add? No, I, I, I think- Yeah, but that is a very good question anyway. Yeah, thank you very much. So any other question? So uh, if there is no question, yeah, okay. So let's see, I think there's one question. Okay, so what program do you recommend for analysis? Oh, okay, so there's a lot of tools to, uh, that can be recommended when it comes to uh, analysis of qualitative data. Now, one of the tools in which I know public health or health uh, personnel use most is we have the uh, SPSS, which is generally particularly used in the university here by health uh, researchers. And then also you can think of SARS. We have STATA as one of uh, the tools you can use for uh, qu uh, qualitative uh, data analysis. Then if we have tools like Minitab, even R, they are all tools which can actually be used for qualitative research. But like I stated, SPSS is quite more often because of its flexibility, you know, it's just point and click and then you get your results. So I can recommend SPSS for you, but SARS and then Stata and others are also the which also tend to be more uh, flexible and then interactive. Thank you. I would also mention in vivo is a, a good qualitative data analysis for, for text. So any other question? So if there's no question coming, then uh, we have a survey which is uh, about this workshop. Uh, we will actually be grateful if you can actually go into the survey and then answer some few questions. It wouldn't take up to maybe uh, two minutes to complete the survey. It actually gives us feedback and then it will guide us on future workshop of this form. So we thank you very much for coming and do you want to say something more? Um, I would just also like to say thank you as well. Uh, if you could fill out the survey, that would be quite helpful. Uh, you can take a look at the survey and tell us if it's qualitative or quantitative after the fact. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day and a fantastic weekend. And we look forward to uh, being able to provide workshops like this in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.